Good evening, everybody. Welcome to CDE Virtual today. We meet at a critical time in South Africa. Last week, we reinforced our constitution and jailed a former president who had tried to undermine everything our 26-year-old democracy stands for. Today, the country is battling lawlessness, destruction of property, and looting that has partly been orchestrated by those who participate in corruption, state capture, and do not believe in our constitution or our democratic ideals, and who have absolutely no interest in making life, in making this a better country for more than half of us who live in poverty. CDE stands with all those who are committed to building up South Africa and pay tribute tonight to the many brave people defending the rule of law on our streets this week. Our conversation today was scheduled months ago, but it could not be more pertinent to events in this country. The vital importance of the rule of law. We have asked former judge Johann Krickler to open this event with a few short remarks. Judge, over to you. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, an honor and a privilege to, to be able to, to say a few words at the commencement of this highly relevant discussion. Uh, I, I agree with Anne that at the time when the topic was chosen, the organizers and Sir Jeffrey no doubt thought that it was a highly relevant subject. Little did they realize that it would be vital to us by the time the debate actually took place. My notes that I made a fortnight ago have become totally irrelevant. They've been overtaken by the reality of our country in flames. And to stick to the academic discussion that I had sort, thought of introducing would be uh, uh, debating the merits of a violin concerto while KwaZulu Natal was up in flames. The topic is cri critically important. And yes, it's no more important ever than at a time like this when we are facing the gravest threat that our democracy has had to confront since we emerged from darkness uh, two decades ago. There's been much talk, much comment, much social media commentary, a great deal of nonsense, some sense, a great deal of speculation, a lot of rumor, a lot of fake news, a lot of intelligent, intentional incitement, a lot of unintentional incitement by giving license to rumor of, of unrest and violence. It is therefore at this time crucially important that we thinking concerned South Africans take time for calm, deliberation, reappraisal of where we are, why we are here, and how we are going to get out of this mess in which we find ourselves. And I can think of no fitting aegis under which to conduct such a discussion than the CDE, which for some 25 years now has been South Africa's leading development uh, in think tank. In fact, I think one need not qualify that. Uh, it's not merely South Africa's leading development think tank, probably South Africa's foremost think tank. It, this evening's event is the eighth webinar in, in a series celebrating the 25 years of CDE's service to South Africa and its people. It has been a serious debating society. It has always been relevant. It has always been scholarly, 
nevertheless accessible even to the likes of me. It has been Catholic in its sweep of research and study. It has been fearless in its comment and in its recommendations. It has tackled the major problems facing our country. And now that those have burst into flame, it will be all the more relevant. They've tackled unemployment and education and service delivery and the, the national health insurance scheme. At all times, its comment has been sober, relevant, market oriented, but engaging with those of different views. Civil society has always been South Africa's safety net. In fact, it's lifesaver on occasions. Back in the early 90s, at the time when we had to go through the hazardous rite of passage of, a, of an election, it was civil society that saw the country through. In the work that I've done elsewhere in the world, I have been struck time and again by the striking difference between the wealth that we have in this country, the insurance that we have, the safety net that we have, the support structure that we have in the strong civil society structure. CDE is one of the foremost of those civil society organizations. And it's with great pleasure that I hand back to Anne to chair this evening's discussion. Thank you very much, Judge, for those very, um, well, welcome remarks. It's a privilege and a pleasure to welcome Sir Geoffrey Joel to the CDE event. Born in South Africa, Geoffrey is one of our most famous exports who played an important role in contributing to the development of our new democratic constitution. He's an emeritus professor of public law at University College London, where he was the Dean and head of the law faculty and, the, and vice provost. A practicing bar barrister, he specializes in the design and implementation of national constitutions, administrative and human rights law. In 2011, he was chosen as the inaugural director of the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law. And among his many other awards, he is an honorary fellow, fellow of Hertford College, Oxford. He was knighted for services to human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in 2011, the same year that the president of Brazil recognized his work on constitutionalism and the rule of law. Welcome, Jeffrey, to South Africa, back to South Africa and to CDE. Let's jump right in. You have said that the apartheid government, while doing appalling things, claimed to be a government that ruled by laws and legality. But in your view, they confused the rule of law with legalism, which is in fact the tool of tyrants. What is the rule of law? Um, I, I just have to start by saying what a pleasure and privilege it is to be here to speak under your auspices. I endorse everything that the great judge uh, and lawyer, uh, Johan Crickler, has just said, and I'm delighted to be under his auspices too tonight. So you ask about the rule of law, and which I said did not apply in the, in the old South Africa, uh, and which was confused with, with legalism. I think the rule of law in short, steers a path between legalism and, and, uh, and which is the tool of tyrants, steers a path really between tyranny on the one hand and anarchy on the other. Uh, and it is, uh, it is often said that it is a, a contested concept, that it's only for the developed world and not for the undeveloped world, that it's only for the North and not for the South, that it's excessively vague and so on. Uh, and it is not, it is, it is perfectly understandable and it is totally clear. What is difficult is to describe it uh, shortly because it has four uh, relating, interacting ingredients, all of which are necessary 
for the rule of law. So bear with me for just a minute to set out those four qualities of the rule of law. And the first is legality, which just means that we're all under, the phrase is often put this way, we're under law and not man or woman. Um, so it distinguishes itself there from, from, from tyranny, the rule of one person with a great deal of broad discretionary power uh, applied uh, without any warning. So uh, that's the first thing. And therefore, we're, we must all obey the law. And that applies very much in South Africa today. But legalities does not only apply to ordinary people. It requires public officials from top down also to act within the scope of their own powers. So all public officials, whoever they may be, however high they may be, must also act under the law. So that's the first element, legality. The second element is certainty. And for some countries who claim they're under the rule of law, they claim that certainty is, is all. It's not all. It's a very important element of the rule of law because it means that we should have access to the rules that govern our lives and that they should be as clear as they can, not made up uh, on the spur of the moment. Uh, and they can, of course, be changed, uh, but with, with a fair warning and they shouldn't be applied retrospectively. So that's certainty. The third element of the rule of law is equality. And that means that the laws that we have must be applied equally uh, and equally against the privileged and powerful as well as the marginalized. And they should also provide equal respect and equal human dignity for everyone. And that's a key element of the rule of law that is often overlooked. And then finally, and uh, often this is neglected as well in the Council of the Rule of Law. And this is really what springs the rule of law into life. Uh, and that is access to rights and justice. Um, this provision, this part of the rule of law requires um, people to be able to challenge decisions made about their lives by public officials in particular uh, in, the, in courts or tribunals, uh, and there, when they're there to have a fair trial before independent judges. So those are the four elements, the four elements of the rule of law. Um, none of this is vague. I often think it's condescending to say that this only applies to the developed world, implying that you know, others may be able to tolerate the lack of legality or the lack of certainty or the lack of equality or not provide access to justice. It's really for everyone. Um, and uh, removing access to justice in particular means that uh, the, the, rule of the, the, the law is pretty well uh, meaningless because the law can't be enforced. In terms of South Africa in the past, um, there was a semblance of legality. I think there are a number of judges who sort of behaved within the law, but of course you couldn't claim that the, the law itself uh, was applied equally. People were told what to do, where to live, how to move, how not to move, and so on. So the laws were, for, for a start, very unjust, but they were also didn't, uh, people could be detained without trial. No rule of law, law there. Um, public officials had impunity. They, it was almost impossible to bring them to book. But people couldn't easily challenge, challenge decisions made against them. Uh, so there was a semblance of legality. There were some very independent and brave judges, but basically they were circumscribed by the situation there, which was not in accordance with the rule of law, but it was in accordance with a kind of dry, uh, uh, sterile legality. So, so Jeffrey, if I was, say, Mrs. Ndukwana living in Kyalecha or Bushback Ridge, why should I care about the rule of law? Ah, well, um, she wants to walk safely at night in the streets. Uh, she wants to not be cheated by the local shop. She wants not to be uh, beaten up in an arbitrary fashion uh, by the, the police. Um, she doesn't want her neighbor to get more benefits to which she may be entitled uh, from the local authority, the local council, 
uh, because her neighbor has paid a bribe. Um, so those are the reasons. Um, and, she'll, and if anything is done against her, she'll want to be able to go and challenge that in some way, either in the court or in another tribunal and so on. Very relevant to the everyday. Great. People. So lots of countries claim to have the rule of law. One thinks of China or Russia or Venezuela or Belarus. But if they all claim to have it, and they're clearly undemocratic states, what does this mean? Does China's success prove that countries can actually develop and become great powers without the rule of law? Well, um, I, I, I was in China um, some years back when the whole economy was controlled by the party, as well as the polity. Uh, it's made quite significant steps towards liberalization of its economic system now. Um, and it used to be thought that if you liberalize the economic system, if you allow free trade and capitalist economy, uh, that will inevitably lead to political liberalization. That hasn't happened in China. And China is now promoting its model of uh, sort of autocratic capitalism through trade and investment under the iron rule of Chairman Xi. Um, and a number of countries, of course, see what's happening in China. And whereas they may be tempted to follow the democratic model after the fall of the Soviet Union in particular, they see China gaining in wealth and confidence. Is it, is it for them an irresistible model? Um, well, again here, China simply doesn't have the rule of law. They claim to have the rule of law because they have some elements of it. Um, you know, legal certainty perhaps in some areas of activity, not all. Um, legality certainly because what the party says goes or must go. Um, equality because they believe in, in social equality. Um, very little of the access to justice and opportunity for challenge, certainly official decisions in the area of human rights. So a thin legality, but the Chinese system is not rule of law. It's what's sometimes called rule by law or rule by the party. Um, will they succeed in the long run? It depends. It partly depends on democratic countries keeping their nerve, keeping to their systems, not apologizing for them. Uh, not saying we, in order, you know, if China can succeed, perhaps we should go somewhere towards what they're doing. Uh, in this country recently, we've had judges called by, called by some elements of the media, enemies of the people when they held against the government. You can, that, you, know, you can understand President China saying that and doing something about it. But when the Western democracies start moving in that direction, and I'm talking also here, of course, about countries you've mentioned in Europe that formerly that de democratized after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, I think it is, it is best to, to counteract that, uh, um, not by you know, overt hostility and hate, by, by calling out China when it does invade uh, our, our values. Um, but also by sticking to them ourselves and leading by example. So you can be a successful country without the rule of law, do you think? Or not well, for it's long? What you mean by success it depends. Would you like to live there, Anne? Would you like to live in a country where uh, there, there, there could be knocks on the door at night uh, to take you away because you, 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 the CDE criticized <laughs> the government uh, as you sometimes uh, have to do. Uh, would you like to be in a country where, the, 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 where you can't really challenge any decision made about you, where you can be moved about, that sort of thing? So you can call that a success if you like, um, but it's a qualified, qualified success. A qualified success. Mm. Well, I certainly wouldn't, but let's uh, I understand the point you're making. Let's move on and talk about South Africa's constitution. You, you have written that the, the post-apartheid constitution adopted something called just administrative action. What is this exactly? I, I wasn't clear what this means. Um, well, 
the, the South African constitution in which I was involved in it in a, in a very in a very small and peripheral way um, in the 1990s uh, is an extraordinary constitution because it in effect um, it had the, South Africa had the opportunity then to simply adopt constitutions that other countries were foisting upon it uh, and uh, Nelson Mandela, to his eternal credit, said, no, we want something that addresses our problems. We'll say never again to what has happened that we don't like, and let's go forward into an area that we, that we want to go, go into, and let's write an original constitution of our own. And it is probably the most original constitution there is, um, mm. because it tackled four of the, 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 the issues that were most worrying about our South Africa discrimination, introduced equality, lack of human rights, it introduced a Bill of Rights after a lot of debate. Um, thirdly, deprivation, uh, it, 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 it embraces socioeconomic rights, um, uh, environmental rights, and so on. So it does deal with that question too, head on. Um, and then finally, uh, tyranny, uh, there's the overweening power of officials. And one of the provisions that was introduced uh, was um, uh, section 33 of the present constitution, the right to just administrative action. And that provides very simply uh, that aspect of the rule of law that allows individuals to challenge the government. And the government is required to act in a way in all its decisions that are legal, that are procedurally fair, and that are reasonable and can give reasons for its decisions as well and as access to information. So there's a lot of that aspect of the rule of law, which is built into the South African constitution in a completely then novel way. It is now, uh, in a few constitutions that I, 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 I've been involved in, found its way <laughs> uh, into other constitutions throughout the world, it's a South African export. It's even found its way into the Charter of Rights of the European, uh, the European Union. It's not exactly in the same way, but there's a right there to good administration. So it's, it's a real product of the South African constitution that's been taken abroad because they tackled outright this notion of practical rule of law, how you implement it, how you can get people to, to, enforce, to enforce their rights. Hmm. How does the rule of law differ from human rights and democracy, in your view? What are these different, I mean, can you slide it all together? Or are they different concepts? What do you They're think? Slightly, they, they, they do slightly overlap. Uh, democracy, if you're writing a new constitution, you ask at the beginning, who rules? Uh, do you want any limit on the rule of the rulers? And how they should rule. So who rules is democracy. And you would say, right, the people through their vote, they elect the representatives. And that's democracy in the narrow sense of the word. The broader sense of democracy is it's a rights-based democracy as in South Africa, as in many other countries, uh, which provides that there are limits to what the people who have been elected by parliament, uh, sorry, elected to the legislature or parliament can do. And this all arises out of what happened, what we saw uh, in the 20th century with elected leaders in Germany and Russia and so on, popular, popular governments doing unacceptable things to their people and uh, acting in a way that seriously offended human dignity, life, and so on. And so um, most democracies now provide the, the how, right, it's an elected assembly, that's democracy uh, in its raw form. They provide a rights-based democracy, that's an, a bill of rights, that's the, the, the bill of rights, which says you can't interfere with freedom of expression, with movement, demonstration, and so on, uh, within limits. And then there's the rule of law, which is the, the how, the accountability, the issues that I've mentioned. We're within that, uh, we are acting in a certain way that is neither tyrannical nor in, involved in anarchy, but involves fidelity to legality, legal certainty, equality, and gives people the opportunity to, to provide for accountability. And that's, in essence, that's what the rule of law does, to mm. make those who make the decisions of the government legally accountable for their actions. 
could provide that opportunity. Jeffrey, you said that the South African Bill of Rights was a revolutionary document. Can you take us through why you think that? Yeah, in a sense, I've, I've, I've just mentioned that, so I, I won't repeat it, but yeah. it was revolutionary in that what went before uh, was so different from what followed. Uh, what went before in all respects was the antithesis of uh, uh, democracy because, you know, <laughs> After all, the majority of the population didn't have the vote. Um, it is the antithesis of, um, of, of human rights because there just were none to speak of. Uh, and that was the antithesis of the rule of law uh, as, as I've already mentioned. So there was you know, a 360 degree turn there in that sense. Now, you may say, you know, has it all worked? Is it perfect? Is the law being enforced? Has there been corruption, which is, by the way, a serious uh, breach of the rule of law because it, 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 um, it, 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 it stands against um, both uh, all the elements of the rule of law. Corruption is not legal. It's, 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 it's not, it doesn't provide for any kind of certainty. It's people giving backhanders. Uh, so there's no equality of favoring people who give bribes and so on and it's very often not enforced against. So there are problems. Uh, as I understand it, you know, all those issues are being seen now, at least for what they are, due to civil society such as yours, due to the press, due to interested individuals. It requires civil society and a culture of democracy as well as the mere constitution to take these things forward. And it seems to me that this is to some extent uh, happening from my recent uh, reading of what's going on. Let me ask you before I move on to a different topic, uh, somebody's just posed a question which I think is pertinent and it'd be interesting to get your view. Is there any circumstance in a society, say South Africa today, where there is mass looting taking place? Uh, do you think this police, the army could be instructed or should be instructed in any circumstances to shoot looters on site? Or where would you draw the line? How do you see the rule of law and public order? Well, um, you know, it's, it's um, the, the normal sort of, let's put it this way, the, uh, the decent way of dealing with that sort of thing would, might be to declare an emergency, which sets out specific powers, which, which again may be justiciable, other people can challenge those powers, um, and not simply uh, meet uh, anarchy with a different kind of force and anarchy, um, to allow the police to take certain measures to restrain and to bring, to strain people and to bring about public order, that of course is within the bounds of any democracy. Whether they should do that by arbitrary uh, a killing or disproportionate action is entirely another matter that normally in the long run creates bitterness, upset, uh, you kill the wrong people. We see it all over the world on our television screen, alas, too often. Uh, but there are ways of restraint uh, by, 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 by less invasive uh, ways than, than, than simply killing on sight. Yeah. which right. are obviously preferable. Yes, obviously. Let me turn to the judiciary. Um, there's some people in South Africa and cabinet ministers have argued this at some times who feel that judges have too much power in our society. After all, who elected them? So who are the judges to tell an elected government and its cabinet ministers and its top officials what they should or shouldn't do. Um, so, you know, the, the average citizen perhaps going home in the taxi to Alex or to Orange Grove might think the politicians have a point. How do you see this issue of judges, the fourth branch or the third branch of, the, of a democracy having too much power? How would you answer this charge? Well, it, it depends what you mean by power here. It's, it's, um, 
I think you've got to make a distinction. You, you've got to understand what judges do and what judges simply don't do or should not do, but probably mostly in 99% of the cases do not do if they're properly trained and properly and decent and properly appointed. Um, politicians deal with policy, with utilitarian calculations of what's the social good, what's the greatest good for the greatest number. That's what we, the politicians deal with. Um, so they'll decide whether there's, should we, should we have a nuclear power station on the site of a park, for example? That's, that's a policy decision. Um, it's not for judges to enter into that matter whatsoever. Judges deal with principle and legal principle. So they could address the question of the nuclear power station. They could say, you know, did you consult relevant, in relevant interests under the statute which requires you to do so? or even under the common law, or under the constitutional uh, role of procedural fairness. These are legal constitutional principles which we can apply, and everybody's under that in this country, including those who cite nuclear power stations. Uh, they could say, well, you've taken into account an irrelevant consideration here. You've given, uh, you've, you've given the procurement for contracts in this nuclear power station to your pals, or you, there's been corruption. They can enter into all that and all those, 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 those considerations. Um, but they cannot say, we would, we would prefer not to have a power station here because that's our opinion, as if you were the decision maker in, in, in the role of, of the politician. So I think that people often confuse that. There are areas within a bit of rights where the judges can touch on subjects which a gray area between, you know, between the legislature and the judiciary, such as maybe such something like, do you have the right to, to die, mercy killing, that kind of thing. Should that be policy or could that be under the, uh, really under the right to life? Does it connect with the right, does the right to die intersect in some way with the right to life, which is under the constitution? Is it protected under the Constitution? But even there, the judges will be interpreting the words of the Constitution, not deciding which policy they prefer. So you've said that judges are in fact accountable and that judicial accountability is probably more stringent than those faced by any other decision maker in our society. That's a very bold assertion I hadn't heard before. Um, what do you mean and how do you justify this claim? I stand by that assertion. <laughs> I've just <laughs> been preparing a case now for a case in, in England. <laughs> and goodness, I've had to go through pages and pages of, pre of previous judgments. Now, what other area of human decision making uh, does the decision maker give you 100 and sometimes 150 pages <laughs> of reasons for their decision. Where does that happen? Sometimes just, you know, a line, sometimes not a line, sometimes just, you know, yes or no. So that's a kind of accountability, isn't it? Uh, there's another form of accountability, which, which is legal cases normally require uh, a, a very independent legal profession to put the case to them first on the one side, then on the other side. So it's in, and in open court. Um, so everything can be seen and monitored. When the judgments, perhaps not always 150 pages, but where, however long they are, uh, come out, they are then uh, they're published, uh, and uh, academics and others can pore over them and criticize them openly, uh, uh, and so on. So that's uh, that's a form of uh, you know a, a deep form of accountability. Not to mention the fact that in many instances, cases from the lower courts can be appealed to the higher courts. So there's another bite at the cherry. Where else in decision-making do you get that? Hmm. Hmm. So I suppose a different question is, what are the limits on the power of the judiciary in a democracy? And how does a country enforce those? Uh, you've talked a bit about that, which is different from being subject to scrutiny by other lawyers, perhaps, or other judges? Yeah, I, I think probably I've sort of answered that question already, because 
the limits are the limits that come out of a a, a training, and uh, it depends on the you know some some judges are appointed immediately after they have their training. They're known as career career judges. Um, I once gave a talk in in China about career judges, and they thought I was talking about Korean judges, and they just in their faces nobody else seemed to understand what I was saying. But career judges in those other countries, um, and in, in 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 South Africa and in other common law countries and elsewhere, the judges are appointed after a lifetime of experience in the law in one form or another. So they realize, I go back to this point, that they can only, mm. should only pronounce on matters of legal principle. Is that particular case within the law or is it outside the law? We can expand the law little by little, but on the basis normally, and this is another constraint that should be mentioned, of previous cases, which you extrapolate not the facts from those cases, but the principles. So in other words, although it seems to be a bit of a U-turn, it's consistent with the principle that has been laid down in cases in the past. That's known as, you know, the, the, well, it's the doctrine of precedent, but also allows the growth of the, the common law. But it's not, again, it's not policy making. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. enforcing the rule of law. Mm. So judges are really important in any society. And you've said that they anchor the delivery of just outcomes, in most cases, in the daily lives of individuals. And therefore, the appointment of judges is absolutely crucial to their independence. How, in your view, should judges be appointed in a democratic society? What are the options for a democratic society? Well, there are various models of appointment. And in the United States, as we know, uh, for the Supreme Court, you have the nomination by the president and then um, endorsement, ratification, confirmation by the Senate. So it's a very political process at that level. At the lower level too, in, in the United States, in some courts, not all, but many courts, judges are elected by the people as, politi you know, as politicians are. And they have their own campaigns. And you know, are they beholden to those who, who pay for their campaign? These are all questions that have mm. to be asked. Uh, so that's one. That's the political model. As I get, as I say, not always in the United States, but in some aspects. In um, in Britain, uh, up, up until two thousand and five, it was the executive who appointed the judges, as used to be the case in South Africa. So our so-called Lord Chancellor, really the Minister of Justice used to appoint judges, <clears throat> how openly, with reasons, no, through what was called a tap on the shoulder um, in, in, uh, after sort of secret soundings. You know, how does this chap operate? Uh, is he, uh, but on the other hand, some of the, most of the, possibly nearly all the appointments were very independently made because there was that kind of culture at the time. Um, but then South Africa introduced this notion of a Judicial Services Commission, which is a sort of independent, I'll come to that in a moment, why only sort of, independent body uh, that appoints your judges. Uh, and that was um, taken forward, uh, I, I recall some of the seminars held by uh, Professor Hugh Corder in Cape Town on that subject. Um, he got, got the idea from a number of former British colonies who'd introduced that kind of appointment. And again, that's something else that spread throughout the world like wildfire, particularly all throughout Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. It's become the norm now to have judicial appointments commissions. And I recall once being involved in a constitutional discussions for an East European country, suggesting to them, maybe you know some of the judges could be appointed by politicians and the, the ex-president of Poland uh, who was on a commission with me said, never again. We used to have, uh, you, you've got to understand the history of, of Eastern Europe. Uh, we used to have telephone judges. What do we mean by telephone judges? Judges who phone up the judge, uh, the politicians phone up the judges, or the judges phone the politicians and say, this is the way you must decide, or how should I decide? So to be completely independent, we must never, she said, allow uh, judges to be 
uh, appointed by politicians again. And the Council of Europe, in fact, went to the United Kingdom at that time and said, we can't have you as a member of the Council of Europe advocating executive appointment of judges when we're trying to persuade the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union countries, such as Poland and Hungary and all that, uh, all those, uh, to, to have independent commissions. And Britain actually, for that and other reasons, decided to change its way and follow the South African model. And it now has a judicial, what's known as a judicial appointments commission that appoints judges in an independent way. Hmm. And that of course creates much greater independence. So going back to South Africa, um, I, the, the, one of the problems I think, I think it's a problem, others might not. Uh, I think it's a problem that there are just too many politicians uh, on the appointments commission. I know not all of them sit for appointments, others do for other matters such as discipline. Uh, but if you want it to be really, truly independent, if you want to provide impartial umpires and referees without any political taint, then it should be actually those numbers, the, polit the political input on the JSC should be reduced. Mm. I know others would disagree. Mm. Great. My last question on the judiciary is something along these lines that you've said that the quality of any judicial system, and thus an important part of a dem democracy, depends on the willingness of outstanding individuals to apply for and accept appointment as judges. Can you talk a bit about why this matters so much and how you think South Africa is doing on this front, if you wanted to comment? Yes, I would like to comment. Um, I, it, 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 you, you've got to get judges in, who, who are of, of the highest, highest quality. There are other aspects, of course, of good judges. They are in this country, are seeking much more diversity than before in terms of gender, in terms of race and so on. Haven't gone far enough in either, perhaps, definitely in, in, in those respects. Um, because after all, the people must relate to the judges and the judges must understand the people. So that's very important. So that those qualities, but it is necessary that uh, simply people who understand and, and really are, are good at, at law and judging uh, should be encouraged to, to apply. Um, I remember a case once somewhere in Africa uh, discussing um, with the woman judge um, how she was going to decide the next case. She was deeply upset, she said, uh, we judges are, are not paid properly. We get a, 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 a free house, but if we hold against the government, that house is taken away. Hmm. Um, and my, my husband has died and I'm supporting uh, five children in school and people are at my door offering me bribes. So judges must be paid properly as well for, 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 for that reason. She said, I'm desperate, I'm independent, but I'm greatly, I have to be occasionally be tempted. Um, mm. And how sad that is. Um, now, South Africa has produced the most, since even before apartheid to some to a great extent, but uh, certainly after uh, the fall of apartheid, some absolutely outstanding judges, one of whom opened the session today. Um, and, um, he, uh, I mean, their, their names are known now all over the world because their judgments are cited with approval mm. uh, uh, and there are quite outstanding constitutional and other lawyers. Um, and that is because I think of the, uh, the high standards of appointment and the high standards of the people who applied to be judges and were then appointed to be judges. Um, so that is remarkable. But what is equally remarkable is that there are a number of great South African lawyers uh, who's, who are known all over the world for their ability and are admired hugely and who would grace the court of most, um, uh, of most judiciaries anywhere in the world who haven't been appointed as judges. And one has seen this time and time again, how one can understand the necessity for 
a diverse judiciary. And that, of course, is also greatly admired here, how that has been achieved and with what high quality. And we saw that in the judgment a couple of days ago about the Mr. Zuma's contempt of, of court. What an outstanding ringing endorsement of the rule of law that was. Um, but th there are a number of, of, of people who haven't been appointed or have been seriously demeaned and ridiculed during the appointments process in the interviews for judges, which raise real questions about whether they're being held back on account of their independence or other possible irrelevant factors. Uh, and that is concerning. Great, thank you. Yeah, very important issues. I'm going to turn to something quite different. I have two big questions now. You were involved in a very big study with the Economist Intelligence Unit on foreign investment and the rule of law. What does growth and FDI have to do with the rule of law in your view? And do big multinational companies and foreign investors really care about the rule of law? After all, they invest in all sorts of strange places that don't have the rule of law. Yeah, well, investors often take punts on you know, countries that don't have the rule of law because there seems to be a, a lot uh, of metal under the ground or, or minerals under the ground, <laughs> whatever, and they'll take their chances. Uh, but I found when I was uh, directing the, the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, we looked around and found that there were very few uh, studies on, you know, did the rule of law actually um, attract uh, a country with the rule of law? Did it really attract investment? Was it seen as a destination for investment and, uh, and an international partner for, for investors? And at the time, um, you know, there were some studies in, in the World Bank and, and so on that were saying, not much relationship, we don't think, between rule of law and in, in investment. And so we did a study with the uh, law firm Hogan Lovells and uh, with the uh, Economist Intelligent Unit carrying out our study. We developed these categories of rule of law, the kind that I described earlier. And we went to, we sought the opinion of about 300 senior decision makers from the Forbes 2000 companies and they had global revenues I think of it was just about each of them was above one billion uh, US dollars each so they were the big investors and we we quizzed them and we asked them questions in different ways uh, I think it was a quite a reliable study as far as I could I could see and we asked you know what uh, what considerations influence you in your foreign direct investment decisions uh, and rule of law came up as one of the two top factors for a number of reasons. I mean, firstly, when they send people into those countries, they want the rule of law to pre prevail for their own safety and security, but mostly because they wanted that kind of legal certainty, adherence to uh, commitments to contracts and, and to property, uh, the opportunity to challenge decisions no retrospective taxation and legislation, all those rule of law factors. Plus the other, the other factor that was, was very important was the ease of doing business. You would know more what I mean about that than I do possibly, but I, I, know, I know what they're getting at. I think the two are linked, rule of law and ease of doing business, of course, are linked. So they, 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 there were those rule of law factors which they definitely said uh, influenced them. And I've seen other studies since which definitely say and, and it, it makes sense that um, countries which respect, you know, legal certainty, equality, legality, and so on, and judicial independence in particular, and fair trials are clearly going to be seen as a destination, as I said, for investment, and, and also uh, to be seen as reliable international partners. So I think there is that link. There's another question, if I, sorry to lead on this one, maybe you could ask it, but maybe it isn't, you haven't had it in mind to ask. But I think you have to dig a little further there and ask when these countries are, the, are invested in, if when people do invest in those countries, uh, are the, the, the spoils, the profits from that investment um, equally, are, are they 
retained or, or denied to the general populace by the ruling elite? Or are the, and the answer is, I think, uh, where there is rule of law, much likely to be greater distributed because mm -hmm. challenge can be made, corruption can be attacked, uh, and there is a compunction uh, to act within the boundaries of the, the legal system. Whereas in countries like, take one example, uh, it always strikes me, Equatorial Guinea. Um, actually, one of the, I think the richest country per capita in Africa, average uh, earning something like $23,000 per, per annum, I think, uh, per capita. Uh, and, uh, and the World Bank has said that 77% 70, of its population live in dire po poverty. And, um, and, and, and I think 15% very, very of its children die before they're five years old. This is huge oil reserves um, and uh, no distribution, very virtual no distribution of wealth. So that's another mm. question. And of course, no, well, I should have said, no rule of law. The leader's been there since 1969. He's simply not interested in anything of that kind. Yeah. So there's a, a, a negative correlation there, just as there's a positive correlation towards investment on the other side. I have one last question because we're running out of time and it's quite a big one. You were involved in a famous case dealing with property rights in Zimbabwe. What were the key issues in the case which you won at the, the SADC tribunal? Perhaps you could pull out a few of the issues there. Yeah, this was a case that was uh, argued mostly by the great, another great South African advocate, Jeremy Gauntlet in um, in Zimbabwe uh, and challenging on the path of the family Campbell and Freeth, the taking of their magnificent farm. That family, by the way, came to Zimbabwe from South Africa because they preferred the way of life of Mugabe's government in its early days. And then they became the victim of a uh, taking of property without any compensation and a change in the constitution so that they had no opportunity to challenge it. So this was a case taken to what was then called the SADC, the South African Development Communities uh, Tribunal in Windhoek, and we went there. Um, and um, it, uh, we, the, uh, the, case, the case by all African uh, ju judges and a very fine, fine court from different countries in Africa held that there was discrimination there because white farmers had their land taken, but, but not black. Um, but most interesting of all, uh, it was said to be a, a, bre a huge breach of the rule of law, not only because they uh, were prevented by a constitutional amendment from challenging the decision in local courts, um, but also because when, it was, when the government of Zimbabwe claimed that this was a perfectly legitimate action because the farms were going to be redistributed to the people, uh, to the needy, to the poor, um, a, 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 a list was undertaken. And we, we found that of all the farms that had been taken by uh, uh, President Mugabe, um, every single one of them was given to what we would call for short, because we're running out of time, a crony, whether it be another member of the government, a, a wife of the president or someone else, boyfriends and girlfriends, air vice marshals, um, chief of police, and so on and so forth. So that redistribution was a distribution to the ruling elite only, and this was called out uh, by the Sadat court, which was promptly, by the way, abolished, and its uh, judgment has never been enforced. Hmm. Hmm. We have a few more minutes, Jeffrey, so I want to ask a question that's only occurred to me now. You don't have to answer. When I think of your definition of the rule of law, which includes access, and one often is asked how these highfalutin concepts appear, you know, what do they mean for poor people? So here's the question from your global experience. Are there any countries you know of that are doing really well at providing access for poor people to the law? Um, 
you know, is there any advice you might have or examples you can think of just off the top of your head of, of that dynamic? Because that is very difficult in a society. And I wondered how, you, you know, what experience you have or advice you might have. Yes, well, there are some countries who, which provide um, legal assistance as part of a sort of welfare package in, in a kind of welfare state sort of way, Northern European countries mostly, um, uh, because they can, and, and you know, they can afford that and uh, it's paid for out of taxation. Uh, in the UK too, there is uh, criminal legal aid and there is also some civil legal aid, which has been badly cut uh, over the years. And that too has been uh, criticized. Those cuts have been criticized as reducing access to justice. There've been a couple of occasions when even the, the price of getting into court, what is known as a court fee, has been raised too high. And our courts have said, here, yeah, that's against the rule of law as a constitutional principle, even mm -hmm. though there's no written constitution here. So there are ways of doing it through, through you know, official state-aided legal aid, various uh, civil organ society organizations that provide that. And in, in high-profile high cases, as we've seen in South Africa, Recently, it's bodies like yours, like Freedom Under Law, like the Helen Susman Foundation, like uh, many others uh, who can help provide uh, public interest, help cases in the public interest generally. So there are all those ways of doing it. But in terms of your person on the street, uh, having the opportunity, having the knowledge of, of a, a street, street law firm, they have, again, some pioneering efforts in South Africa over the years that I've seen the university uh, uh, at various universities to provide for a program of street law, that kind of thing. I'm probably missing out uh, mm. quite a few other experiments in this direction, but I think you know, the state can only do so much and when the state is, is, is charged with other, other priorities, particularly in, this difficult, in these difficult times, it, it's often, unfortunately, the legal aid budget that's cut first, if there is a legal aid budget. Mm. And how would you respond to the question I've been asked, which is, that sounds all very well, um, fair enough, but how does a legal aid lawyer, which is generally going to be not the best lawyer in town, how do they compete with somebody, an excellent lawyer like yourself, um, who the sort of big company can afford to, to get your services? How, how do you respond to that question? Ah, uh, well, I, 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 I'm sorry, Anne, I don't buy that. <laughs> For one thing, I do think it's the obligation of high paid lawyers to provide as much pro bono advice uh, uh, as they can, for one thing. And certainly we find a lot of that's going on uh, at, at the moment. And I think a, a lot of mm. lawyers do that. Secondly, don't underestimate uh, the the, the legal aid lawyer. Uh, I mean, they are heroes, and uh, there's some very fine lawyers who take cases uh, that would never have got heard, bring, bring out principles that might not have been considered simply because they're close to the people and they understand the impact of the decision on their lives. So um, I, think, I think that, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I don't buy it in, in, entirely. Great. Well, you've given me some arguments to use against people who raise that sort of question. Um, we've come to the end of our hour. So, Jeffy Joel, thank you very much for a fantastic and very informative and educative for me um, discussion on the rule of law and why it is of such paramount importance for democracies and for everybody in a democracy. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Anne, very much Great. indeed. Thank you. Great. So we're, we're finished, everyone. We're over for tonight. Thanks for joining us and um, keep safe and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thanks.